Thank you very much. Um, normal rules of etiquette apply. If you don't like anything I say, feel free to take your shoes off and throw them at me, <laughs> as usual. Uh, I do want to talk about this year's Nobel Prize and also my own new book, which has just been published under the title Why Men Are Necessary, and which will make a very good Christmas present if I can encourage you to buy one, or if you've got ten brothers, ten. W what is the link, you may ask, between one of the great art prizes of this country, home to a startling series of creative images, and a cheap comedy book about day-to-day -day life in the suburbs of Sydney? Uh, well, I think you're a bit rude to put it that way, but you may have a point. Here is the link, though. Many of the artists featured in this year's Dobell share my passion for recording day-to-day -day life. Like me, they are interested in things that other people think are the detritus of life. When you take a tour, as I, I hope you will in a moment, consider Noel McKenna's piece called Captured, Rome, Catch, Captured Rodents. It's just around the corner there. And it's a tiny, roughly framed picture of two mice caught in a trap the banality of a PowerPoint in the left of the frame somehow adding to the tiny tragedy of these two deaths. Or Michael Essen's internal affair with its shower curtain, chicken feet and half-eaten apple. Or Jana, Jana Hunt's artefact, a baby smock, beautifully rendered but somehow indistinct as if remembered through a mist of memory. You'll find that about halfway through. Or perhaps my personal favourite, and you'll find it right up against the back wall, is Catherine O'Donnell's Number 19, a picture that reminds you of Geoffrey Smart. And if you want to do the comparison, the Geoffrey Smarts are just behind me here. It's got the same ability as Geoffrey Smart to find beauty in what would normally be thought of as a piece of ugliness. In Catherine's case, a block of flats, the much maligned 1960s model, but rendered so it seems to glow with life. And somehow in her hands, even the bolted on air conditioning unit somehow seems full of personality. Of course, there is a great tradition in art of recording the day to day. In some ways, it goes back to the very beginning of art. If a cave painting of somebody spearing a kangaroo or, or using a bow and arrow to shoot down a bison is, is anything, it's a recording of the day-to-day -day activities of the time, of ordinary day-to-day -day life. For much of history, though, I think art lost touch with that job, with that task, and the more common task became the recordings of the doings of rulers, of the saints, of the gods, of the generals. And if you wander through the Fairfax galleries here, of course, you'll see an, a many examples of that, from the Queen of Sheba, who mysteriously seems to have forgotten to wear any clothes to her own crowning, to the great battle scenes featuring generals and horses with flaming nostrils, to, um, to the scenes of, of the lives of saints and, and the gods. And a lot of this, I think, thankfully changed, especially in the second half of the 19th century, and there became this renewed interest in the day-to-day -day and in the doings of ordinary people. And you can see it in the second half of the 19th century everywhere. You can certainly see it extremely strongly in the writers, in people like Dickens and Zola and Strindberg, all, all of them writing about um, ordinary working class people and the sort of travails of their lives. You can see it in the historians who suddenly in this period become interested in social history, not just the lives of kings and queens, but in what ordinary people were doing. And certainly you can see it in the artists, most obviously, I suppose, in the Impressionists. And you think of someone like the French artist uh, Pissarro, who of course was himself the subject of a big exhibition here um, only three or four years ago. And he had this explicit commitment to the ordinary, to the mundane, and even to the supposedly ugly. And if you saw the exhibition here at the Art Gallery, um, you would see pictures, you would have seen his pictures of, of people cleaning the house, of washing up, of doing manual work. There's a, a quote from Pissarro where he talked about this process. He said, one can make beautiful things with so little. Happy are those who see beautiful things in modest places where others see nothing. It's lovely, isn't it? Happy are those who see beautiful things in modest places where others see nothing. Everything is beautiful. The whole thing is knowing how to interpret. Now, in some ways, walk into a bookshop today and there's an argument, I think, that we've gone backwards since that high point of interest in the day-to-day -day 
and in the ordinary. There's a million books in the average Sydney bookstore about the top end of town, about the millionaires and the politicians. There's another million titles in the bookstores of Sydney about the bottom end of town. Uh, crime stories, the stories of the underbelly TV show, of drug abuse, of violence. The whole crime section, which seems to, the true crime section, seems to get bigger and bigger by the day. Um, and the middle of life, the life most of us live, seems to be considered too bland to be worth recording. And I've never shared that view that ordinary life is boring and bland and not worth recording. And so for 25 years, I've tried to capture ordinary life, kind of middle class suburban life, I suppose, through writing about my own family. And the most common response I've had, or at least the one I like the most, is people who say, it sounded like you had a tape recorder in our kitchen, or it sounded like you had a tape recorder in our car. And uh, sometimes I wonder why I've been interested in this task, because it is a task that I think most people think, most writers think is beneath them, too bland, too ordinary, too boring. Uh, like most dysfunctional responses to the world, I think it goes back to childhood. I've always written in the genre that you could call comedy or humour. And in a way, that genre is an expression of my life, which has always played itself not out as tragedy, but as a sort of low comedy. My mother walked out on the family when I was about 14. And you could call that a small tragedy, I suppose, except my mother did it with an instinct for low comedy. She ran away with my English teacher, <laughs> who she had met at parent-teacher night which somehow makes it worse. I don't know why. So, you know, if, you, if I do encourage you to buy this book and you find any grammatical errors in it, please see it not just as a mistake but as a cry for help that my English teacher should never have left and taken my mother with her. Um, my father was heartbroken by her departure and for a time, I mean, he did come back in the end, but for a time he left too. He went back to England and left me in this house on my own at age 14. I was on my own, you know, and uh, I, I felt at that time that I wasn't, the favourite child in the family, which is quite tough when you're an only child, I think. Um, and I used to sort of... Uh, I, look, I don't weep and well about this anymore. I, I, agree, I agree with Samuel Butler that anyone who talks at all about his parents and what they did to him after he's about 35 years old should get a life. But still, I, I did used to, uh, you know, whine about this a little bit. And one of my friends said, yes, 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 Richard never really left home. Home left him, which is a fairly accurate way of putting it. And it's not that I you know, want to give a hard time to my parents who had their own problems and their own dramas, and, 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 and nor claim my childhood as some sort of disaster, because I think everyone's childhood is a mixture of positive and negative things, and mine had plenty of positive things in it. But I, I suppose if my somewhat unhappy childhood contains any insight at all, allows me to have any insight at all, it's this that functional families are actually incredibly exciting and important and worth writing about. That, that the life, that if you're lucky enough to have this life in the middle where the family kind of holds together, that is something really worth writing about and celebrating and, and noting. And it amazes me still that kind of not very many people are keen on doing it. I look at the high end of the literary market and authors I you know, adore are all writing about dysfunctional life of some sort. And you, you, know, you go through the literary writers and you see someone like Anne Tyler, for instance, who's a fantastic writer. If you haven't read Anne Tyler, I really com commend it to you. But Anne Tyler writes about ordinary life, ordinary kind of middle class life. Patrick Gale is an English novelist who writes about ordinary middle class life. And you, you start to run out amazingly quickly in, in terms of literary writers writing about not rich people, not poor people, but kind of most of us. Um, like uh, just as the artists of the Nobel chose choose particular scenes, particular people to illustrate their themes. So at the heart of this book is a particular character, Jocasta, a heightened version of my own partner, Deborah, who is a feisty, sharp-tongued, sexy as hell, demanding, take-no-crap Australian woman. Uh, Deborah, for her part, wants me to tell you tonight that she is much nicer than Jocasta. <laughs> Something I'm uncertain about. Uh, I, I feel for the last 25 years I've been the Boswell to her Johnson, just scurrying around after her with a notebook. Uh, like when quite recently, and maybe you've done this in your household too, I was doing the full uh, global warrior routine. I'd been to see 
um, an inconvenient truth and I'd become fired up about it. So I was running around the house, turning off all the lights, turning off the heaters, it was a bit cold, uh, turning off all the computers. Yes, some school work and homework was lost. Um, but, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, finally sort of Deborah had enough and the breath was coming, steaming out of her mouth into the winter's cold. And she said, you know, you've got to stop turning off the heaters. And I said, I cannot. I'm a global warrior. I'm saving the planet. I'm doing this for us all. And she said, you are so not a global warrior. You're just a mean tightwad who's found a new excuse for saving money. <laughs> That's the inconvenient truth. Yeah. At this point, other men would take offence. I don't. I just run and get my notebook. Um, quite recently, we went for our, tw our, th our 30th anniversary. I mean, we're not married, but it was the 30th anniversary of, of getting together. And we, get we went into town for a special, um, a special meal. We went on the bus, which gave her another opportunity to say I was a mean type one. Um, but as we got off the bus, and it is true I've put on a little bit of weight since we met, um, her eyes lingered over my belly. And she said, you know what? For 30 years, I've stuck with you through thin and thick. <laughs> Cruel but accurate. Others people would be offended. I ran for the notebook. Uh, recently, we've been doing that thing where you buy curtain fabric and couch fabric. Again, this is ordinary, mundane, day-to-day -day life. But certainly, we've been through that thing where I think, looking back on it, we were, we were aware that we had no taste. We were aware that we were people without taste and we had no courage about it. So you'd go to all these curtain shops and fabric shops and you look through those big books they've got and you'd look at each other and you'd look at the lady and you'd take advice and at some point in the process you would become overcome with this enormous fear because you just didn't trust that you had any taste at all. And you would say, let's go for the oatmeal. Let's go for the beige. No chance of offending anyone then. We'll just go beige. And so for years, everything in our house was beige or oatmeal to the extent that you could sort of pour porridge on it and you wouldn't notice. On the and, and finally, there was this moment recently where we went and we bought, that we went through the books and we talked to the lady. And there was this moment where Deborah looked up and she said, the oatmeal years are over. You know, a phrase that strikes terror into the heart of, 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 of any partner. And indeed, we bought something incredibly red red like a Berlin nightclub, and yet also floral. <laughs> and we had this done at enormous expense, and Deborah walked in and looked back and looked very glum and said, it looks like a Hertfordshire brothel. <laughs> Highly accurate. How she knows what a Hertfordshire brothel looks like, I, I don't know. But one of those depressing moments when you realise we should have stayed with the, uh, with the beige. Some of my notes about her go back years, like the camping trip we, we took very early on when we'd only just met and I took her away and as you do with the camping trip, you drive up, it's inevitably dusk by the time you arrive. You've inevitably got a boot full of tent parts, missing the three that you absolutely need and you're trying to put up the tent in high wind with the car lights, the car battery slowly starting to go as you do it and the tent ends up listing on one side as the dusk comes down and Deborah got in, went to lift up the tent flap and said to me, an inadequate erection. <laughs> No doubt the first of many. <laughs> this is virtually the first date. And, and so it has been until quite recently. We, we've had, uh, about three years ago, we had the experience of doing the home brew. And, and again, Boswell to her, Johnson, we, we, uh, if, you, if, if you've done home brew, you might know the, 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 the scenario. You've got to get the temperature of the keg of fermenting liquor to absolutely the perfect temperature. And they sell you a, a thermometer when you buy the kit. And so you move it around the house and you find that at the front of the house it's too hot and the back of the house it's too cold. And so in my case, I found that in my 16-year-old's son's bedroom, it was perfect. The Cinderella moment. So I cleared the homework off the desk and the little Roman forts that he'd been industriously building and popped the keg there and it fermented away very happily. And Deborah hit the roof and said, you cannot turn your 16-year-old son's room into a brewery. It's absolutely disgusting. And I said, no, I must. It's the perfect temperature. And so it's punishment. She made me sleep in there all night. And I got up in the... Because they, they smell and they sound. And, they, 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 and I got up in the morning. I said, it was terrible. Didn't sleep a, a wink all night. All night long next to this farting, stinking, belching tub of booze. And Deborah said, now you know how I feel most nights. <laughs> See again, I just, Boswell, I just go and, 
and, and write it down. Like Boswell, I've also taken, notice of the, taken note of the list that she prepares whenever she goes away. Let me tell you about the list, although I think the gentleman here will know about the list. You've probably been on the receiving end of the list. It happens every time your partner goes away and she leaves, in my case, an A4 piece of typed notes stuck to the fridge in which she paints well, she, she has a list of all the things I've got to do to keep the house afloat while she's away. But the general tenor of the thing is a, a portrait of me as a domestic incompetent, unable to run his own shower, never mind a household. Feed the dog each evening will be the opening sally of advice. And then an afterthought in brackets, to do this you'll need to get some meat out of the freezer each morning. And already she's left me confused. If I'm to thaw the food before serving it, why is that the second step and not the first step? And doesn't she realise that men rarely read past the first sentence in any instruction manual? And so if she comes back and the dog has shattered teeth from eating frozen food, it can hardly be my fault. Next up, she offers some personal advice. Don't drink on weeknights. And this is helpfully written in block capitals, no doubt so I can read it through any drink-induced haze should I neglect to see the note early in proceedings. Point three is a blizzard of instructions involving the washing and ironing of school uniforms. And I find this particularly galling since I do most of the household ironing and washing. And I develop this ambition to send a fax note, if only we had a fax machine, but a fax note through to her Melbourne hotel room, pointing out in block capitals the location of the iron, just in case you should ever want to use it one day. If she's going to communicate to me in block capitals, I'll return the favour. I also notice that the household exists in a perpetual school uniform crisis due to the fact that the space cadet has only three shirts and two pairs of pants, and I'm unwilling to disclose who is in charge of school uniform purchasing, but she hasn't done a very good job. <laughs> Point four is again in capital letters and says, don't have an affair while I'm away. Now, I assume this is meant to be some sort of humorous aside, since offers haven't exactly been coming in thick and fast in the past 30 years. Since I spend all my time at either work, commuting, or doing the ironing, I wonder exactly when I'm going to fit in this steamy affair. But if anyone's interested, I find I have about five minutes free at about a quarter to seven each morning. We then get on to food, and it's as if I've never prepared a meal in my life. There are lamb chops in the freezer, the list says, before adding the witheringly dismissive detail. These are on the shelf, not to be confused with the dog food in the freezer below. I mean, how insulting is that? The trouble about the list is that it paints an all too vivid picture of the person Jocasta or Deborah believes she lives with, an incompetent dipsomaniac who is unable to pick the difference between a lamb chop and a chicken neck. And it's clear that she thinks if it weren't for the list, the boy and I would be sitting around the kitchen table, him in stinking rags, uh, me pissed out of my mind, gnawing our way through a plate of frozen dog food as I try to allocate the quarter to seven spot between my various girlfriends. <laughs> But despite all this, like most people, I know I've been made by her and her by me. And it does seem to me that there's part of our culture at the moment that seems to believe that the negative is somehow always more authentic and real than the positive, that a bleak ending is more brave than the one that strives for redemption. You see sometimes now theatre reviews in the City Morning Herald, which virtually say, the play was really great, it was fantastic. And then you can see the author, the, the play reviewer, searching for a way of proving his case. And the second paragraph really just says, yeah, it was really bleak. As if that's almost enough. As if the fact that it's really bleak, well, that proves that it must be really good and really challenging. In the new book by the Booker winner DBC Pierre, the Western world, for instance, is pictured as a place in a state of terminal decline. His new book starts with, on page one with a character who's decided the world is so bad he's going to commit suicide. And it kind of goes downhill from there. Now, I've interviewed the, the inter interviewed the author on 702, and in person, DBC Pierre comes into the studio, very jolly, very happy man, smiling, eyes twinkling, uh, the cheeks, you know, red with, uh, we're, well, mostly red with alcohol and heroin abuse, but, but, you know, red with the glory of life. And it's at moments like that, you just, I get really curious. Is this image of this bleak, awful dystopia that he creates in the book, is it what he really thinks? Does he really look at life and actually think it's rather pleasant, but thinks we all want 
him to tell us life is terrible, and so he bullshits us. He puts this in the book that it's really terrible, whereas he doesn't really believe it. The London of Martin Amos. Uh, London, Ma Ma Martin Amos is one of my favourite writers. I think he's the great stylist of our time, or one of the great stylists of our time. And yet, if you analyse the amount of crime in a book like London Fields, it is as if there's a crime at the end of every street in London, as if every toilet block in every park has got police tape around it because of some terrible pedophile murder. If you really believe that London was as bad as Martin Amos writes it is, you would never leave your house. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's been locked in there for the last 30 years, terrified to come out. But I don't believe that. I don't believe he believes London is as bad as that. And it strikes me as weird that the image of crime, for instance, which comes through the London Sun, is actually the same image as comes through Martin Amos. That we have developed a culture where the top end literary product and the bottom end tabloid product both have this one eyed view that the world is being overrun by crime and is a terrible place where you're fearful to tread. And this at a time when we know all the statistics tell us that crime is going down. And it has been for, for 10 years now. And when we see this one-eyed view of the world on a television program like A Current Affair, we condemn it, don't we? We say that is one-eyed, base-level journalism of the most fear-mongering type. But when we see it in literary culture, we praise it as honest and forthright and not trying to gloss over with happiness. How this happened in our culture, I really don't know. I think it might be as simple as the fact that Hollywood in the 30s and 40s and, and with Mr Disney became very adept at producing happy endings, pasted on manipulative happy endings. And we as an audience said, we don't want that, we don't want to be fooled, we don't want to sit there like paps being served up this kind of you know, pasted on false happy ending. And so we rejected all happy endings and with them we rejected the idea of uh, of, of an ending which had some sense of earned redemption. Now, the, the novelists of the 19th century were never so stupid as to throw that all out. If you read Dickens and Tolstoy and Balzac and Flaubert, you see this perpetual tension between the reality of the world, the dark reality of the world. I mean, they all had enormous, uh, you know, enormous passion about the social problems of the time. I mean, something like Zola is absolutely thick with it. And yet they had the idea that humanity could strive for some sort of redemption. And the glory of these books, of these 19th, the great 19th century books, of the realist tradition, is that there's a constant fight between kind of what humanity is, our role in, our, our sort of station in the gutter, if you like, and our ability to somehow try to reach for the skies. And it's in that which the books kind of live and breathe and become very exciting. They're, none of them have pasted on happy endings, but they do have a sense that human beings can strive for some sort of redemption. They're not just totally bleak as if that is the only way of achieving some sort of honesty. But we seem to believe, uh, we seem to prefer to be told that our world is awful and bleak and horrid. And I think this reached the absolute low point in the recent election campaign when Australian politicians of both parties seriously went to places like the seat of Lindsay and told Sydney siders that really nobody had had it worse ever in the history of the world than them. They could feel their pain. Mr Rabbit and, uh, and, the, and uh, Julia Gillard could feel their pain. They knew what it was stuck, like being stuck on Windsor Road. They knew what it was like to, to, to be up against it trying to pay petrol prices and food prices. Now, you know, I'm not mocking the difficulties of ordinary life, obviously, but for people to seriously say, no one's had it worse than you. You are the most benighted people in the history of Australia and the history of the world. At a time when Pakistan was under water, uh, Afghanistan was under fire, and Europe had been just devastated by the European financial collapse, was frankly obscene. It was obscene and ridiculous. We are, you know, we are living in this glorious time, and for politicians to pander to us and tell us that we've got it awful is just, you know, sick and ridiculous. So. You know, this book is, is designed as an antidote to all that bleak news, bad news and bleakness. And I'm sure a lot of people will think this book is naive and ridiculous and too sunny um, for its own good, too sweet, if you like. But for me, it's a defiant refusal to see the world in that one-note way and to believe is somehow more authentic, more literary, more brave. I think, I think the false note for us are things like the way we all roll our eyes about our teenage children. I do it too. It's required by the culture now to say, oh, aren't they terrible? Yeah, mine's even worse than yours. We all roll our eyes. Nearly none of us really believe it. 
None of us really, most of us think our children are wonderful and all their friends are wonderful. We think they are the best generation that's ever been and much better than we were. At their, that's what we truly believe, but we don't allow ourselves to say that. I mean, most people in their heart of hearts, I think the only mystery about their teenage children comes when they go into the, the, the adult goes into the bathroom, looks in the mirror and thinks, how did they get to be so good looking with this genetic stock? That's the main mystery about our children. And yet we insist on rolling our eyes and saying they're terrible and life is terrible. Maybe it's why I like Catherine O'Donnell's drawing of the block of flats I mentioned at the beginning, the way she makes it so enticing, the way ordinary and drab though it may be, she seems to understand the life that throbs and glows in it, that works beneath that air conditioning unit and those bleak brick facades. And some of us, the ones who've been lucky enough to be blessed by living in the middle, the suburbs, a partner, kids if we're lucky, we are blessed. We are blessed. And the least we could do occasionally is acknowledge it and give thanks. And that's what I've tried to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've, got, um, I've got four minutes. So I, I just wanted to read you a, a piece from the book to try to give you a, a sense of it. Uh, you're about to go into the Dobell Prize, I hope, and, and look at tiny things from life. So this is a, a tiny scene from life. It's called The Aspirational Man. At the video store, hope springs eternal. As I browse through the racks, I see myself as an intellectual, a man interested in the history of cinema, a chap who wants to understand la condition humaine. I sniff haughtily at the latest Hollywood releases and make my way to the art movie section. I select something French and challenging from Francois Truffaut, and head home. You got what? Says the space cadet, a look of displeasure creeping on, onto his face. He stares at the box. It's in French. <laughs> oh yes, I say. Truffaut was one of the most famous French filmmakers. He was an auteur. Alerted by the tone of disputation, Jocasta wanders in. She looks at the box. You got what? She asks a look of displeasure creeping over her face. She stares at the box. It's in French. Oh, yes, I say. Truffaut was one of the... Jocasta jumps in. I know who Truffaut was. I just don't know he's my definition of Friday night entertainment. You were supposed to get something fun. I'm disappointed by their reaction. Don't they want to better themselves? I used to know quite a lot about Francois Truffaut. I say to Jocasta, when I was at uni, I used to subscribe to film comment and everything. I was quite the cineast. Jocasta rolls her eyes. You were so not a cineast, she snorts. You were a pretentious tryhard. <laughs> you seem to forget I knew you at uni. <laughs> I make a mental note. Meeting your life partner at age 20 does have its drawbacks. We all sit down and watch the Truffaut. The movie is very good as is the bottle of Shiraz I've been dipping into since arriving home. Four scenes into the film, the bottle is half empty and I'm fast asleep on the couch. <laughs> the next morning, Jocasta and the space cadet agree the Truffaut was terrific and they quite enjoyed the fact it was in French with subtitles. If it wasn't, says Jocasta, we'd never have followed the plot over all the snoring. <laughs> they wonder, however, whether next Friday I could get something a little more recent. Friday rolls around and I choose something from 1999 so there can be no complaints. It's Spanish and directed by Almodovar. Not again, says the space cadet. Not again, says Jocasta. They stare at the box and speak at one. It's in Spanish. Oh yes, Almodovar is one of Spain's most... I'm shouted down. It seems they both know Almodovar's work quite well. We open the wine, turn on the DVD, and the first five scenes are excellent, after which I tumble into a state of unconsciousness. The next morning, Jocasta and the space cadet report the film was fabulous. Jocasta, however, is worried I may be hiring movies that are over my own head. <laughs> Who exactly are you hiring these films for, she asks. I'm an aspirational guy is my reply. I'm the sort of guy who reads the Russian classics, who cooks complex and authentic meals, and who watches European films. That's just who I am. Jocasta takes me by the hand and guides me through the house. I've been wondering about that aspirational guy, she says, because he's left a lot of stuff around the house. She points to my bedside table where there's a great stack of books, a thick Russian novel, a few black-spined Balzacs, plus a slender book of British verse. That aspirational guy, 
He owns all of those, doesn't he? I warily nod my agreement. Says Jocasta, he hasn't quite got round to reading any of them yet, has he? I shake my head sadly. And those clothes in the cupboard, she continues, reefing open the door, all those pants in size 32, who owns those? My voice comes out in a tiny squeak. The aspirational guy. And those cookbooks about authentic Indian curries, Jocasta says, guiding me towards the kitchen with the three shelves of unopened spices to go with them. The aspirational guy, she asks. Actually, I tell her, I was going to have a go at that curry this weekend. You know what, says Jocasta, I'm impressed by that aspirational guy. I like his spirit, and I don't even mind the guy who falls asleep on the couch halfway through the movie. I think he's quite sweet. It's just tough sharing the house with two men, especially when they have such different tastes. I can see what she means. Maybe next Friday I'll go and get the DVD myself and leave the aspirational guy at home. That way he can catch up with all his reading. And that's the news from nowhere. Thank you.